What I'd like you to do is imagine what it was like when you were very, very young. Not one or two years old, but basically nine months before you were born. What happens is you start off as a single cell. All your genetic material came from mum and dad. They passed on two sets of chromosomes. So we have up here a picture of the human karyotypes. Female on the left, male on the right. So the only difference between these are the little circles down the bottom. The females have two X chromosomes, males have one X chromosome and a Y chromosome. Now, DNA, superficially, it's incredibly boring. It's just a long molecule with four different letters, A, C, G, T, and it's the order of these A, C, G, T that carries all our genetic code. From a single cell, you've obviously grown a little bit. You've got kidneys, liver, brain, skin, all sorts of different cells. They all have the same genetic makeup. Different genes are expressed in different tissues. Some are switched on, some are switched off. I've been fascinated by how genes work, because when you can work out how a gene is working, you can start coming up with potential therapies to try and treat them. Now, we have 23,000 different genes. Sounds impressive. We have three billion letters, A, C, G, T, that make up each set of chromosomes. So that sounds impressive, but let's put it into context. We're outgunned by the water flea. We have 23,000 genes. The water flea, Daphnia, has 31,000 genes. There are plants out there that have 50 times the amount of DNA in their cells than we do. So obviously it's not how much DNA you've got or how many genes, but how you use them. So if we go off to our picture of a little segment of DNA which carries the genetic information, our gene, what happens is when a gene is expressed, it makes a photocopy. And so you get an RNA copy, a message copy, that contains blocks of coding sequence separated by the yellow non-coding sequence. And this is happening for almost all of our 23,000 genes that have this particular structure. They go through this arrangement. And for this gene to be expressed and then read, you take out the yellow bits. And this is a process called splicing. It brings it together. So that's our mature gene message. Every time a cell divides, all that genetic material has to be copied. And DNA replication, it's pretty good, but it's not perfect. Mistakes happen. Just look around the room. <laughs> Everyone is different. We all have the same genes, but we have subtle variations that affect eye color, hair, height, metabolism, and so on. And a lot of the DNA changes won't make any difference. But when they occur in an important gene, then there can be problems. So in the example here, we've got a, a spelling error in the DNA, the red block. That carries through to the messenger RNA, and then when that is spliced, the message downstream of the mutation is corrupted. So it's like reading a book. You've got a massive book of instructions. You're halfway through it, and it says, stop reading. The rest of the message might be there, but you're not allowed to read beyond that point. This is the normal, perfect human DNA. But everyone in this room is carrying one to two lethal gene mutations. What I mean lethal, either incompatible with life or it's going to result in a severe disease. It's quite scary. The examples here, we've got the little red the lightning bolts showing where particular mutations could occur. But you'll see that you have a defective copy in one chromosome but the other parent has given a, a copy that is working. So this is why you're here. And on the X chromosome, women have two copies, so they can carry a defective copy of a gene, and there's a backup copy. However, if a boy inherits a defective gene on the X chromosome, there's no backup copy, and this leads to what's called an X-linked recessive disease. Now, the one I've been spending too much of my life on is a condition called Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Now, this is such a cruel, devastating disease on so many fronts. One in three cases is a new mutation. That is, the gene is very error-prone. It's an accident waiting to happen. The boys are born, they look normal, and that is because the protein that is uh, responsible for this disease normally gives strength and stability to the muscle fibers. 
In the absence of a functional protein, the muscles break down faster than they should. So when the boys are young, the muscle growth is keeping up with the degeneration. And so for the first few years, they're not too bad. One of the early symptoms is you'll have enlarged calves. And the parents think, fantastic, we're going to have a sportsman here, a real athlete. Those enlarged calves are a marker of muscle damage. The muscle's been replaced with fat and connective tissue. As the disease progresses, the boys get weaker and weaker. They're in a wheelchair by the age of 12, most commonly. In the absence of good health care, 90% would die before they were 20 from cardiac and respiratory complications. They become too weak to just breathe. Speaking of some of the parents, they described this as a death by a thousand cuts. The gene was identified in 1986, and there were confident claims that gene therapy, replacing the gene, could work. Or stem cell therapy, or even muscle cell therapy could work. For various technical reasons, these haven't come through. Well, then about just over 20 years ago, I came up with this crazy idea. Instead of trying to replace the gene or add new cells, what if we try and repair the expression of the damaged gene? And so here we go with our defective gene message. And we've come up with a compound, a genetic drug, the chemistry name is Phosphodiamidite Morpholina Oligonucleotide. There'll be a test at the end for people to spell this. <laughs> so the way this works is like a paintbrush. It actually masks over the defective part of the message. So when it's brought together, all of a sudden, we restore a shorter message. So going back to the book analogy, you've come to the part that says, stop reading, you basically tear that page out or cover it with whiteout. You then go on to the rest of the story. You might miss a little bit in the middle, but you've got the ends, the beginning and the end of the story, and that's the crucial thing. Just glossing over 20 years of hard lab work with a very dedicated team, we were designing different types of paintbrushes, looking at different spelling errors in the gene to work out where to put these compounds. We've worked on animal models, we've worked on human cells, and we've come up with a compound that's been in clinical trials now. This has been in clinical trials in the States for the trials running for about five years. And this is a young lad called Billy. Now, Billy is, at this stage, 13 years old. Two years before this, he couldn't walk up or down this path. And just listen to the next bit. He's walking uphill and whistling. So his breathing is stabilised. Last year, he actually finished the Pittsburgh Children's Marathon. He was 14 years old. <laughs> and he was then complaining that they weren't playing Chariots of Fire as he crossed. <laughs> I mean, he's 15 going on 40. But he, he's an amazing kid. Now, for this drug to go to other boys, we had to have approval from the Food and Drug Administration of the US FDA. And I'm delighted, relieved, ecstatic, numb, that less than a month ago, approval was given. <laughs> Thank you. This is just what I'm hoping is going to be the first of a new type of genetic drug. There are 7,000 inherited diseases described. And there's the potential for this type of therapy to be applied to many, many different mutations. The type of spelling error that affects splicing is estimated to be between 10 and 20% across all the mutations. This type of therapy is applicable to many, many different conditions. So we're working on spinal muscular atrophy. We're working on cystic fibrosis, Pompe's disease, Huntington's disease, phasioscapulohumeral humeral muscular dystrophy. Another test on that name as well. <laughs> and the reason you get into medical research is to try and make a difference. And I'll just show this video of uh, a young lad called Aidan. Aidan, at the start of the trial... I can't. See, I... You can sense the frustration. Aidan's just over 12 years old. Then four months into the treatment. Okay, so he can get into a car now. And the last one, I'll just leave you with, I want you to look at the expression on his face and his mother's voice. Oh. 
<laughs> Thank you very much. This is over 20 years of work, isn't it, that you've, you've done here? It must be really hard, and you've been working with a, with, with a large I've, team. I've got a fantastic group of people. I've got to acknowledge Sue Fletcher, Abby Adams, Kane Greer, Kristen West. We've got a fantastic research team at Murdoch at the moment, and they're a, they're a privilege to work with, yes. and the colleagues overseas. And, and how hard was it to get the FDA approval? Because it, this is something quite new. Isn't it? This is the first type of its drug ever released or ever approved. It's the first phosphodiamidate morpholino oligonucleotide <laughs> ever approved. It's the first dystrophin restoring drug that has shown an unequivocal increase in the missing protein after treatment. Um, it's the first splice switching compound that I'm aware of that has been approved. That this is a specific compound that's been approved. I don't want to overstate it here, but are we talking about you know, a new type of medicine? <laughs> I would like to think that this has enormous applications to so many different conditions. From the size of this room, we would have, I'm guessing, 50 to 60 people who are carriers of the cystic fibrosis defect gene. There will be 40 people in here, at least, who are missing the spinal muscular atrophy gene, SMN1. This is going to become, hopefully, a personalised treatment. The thing is, we've got a huge genome, spelling errors at different parts. What our goal is to come up with the paintbrushes that will sort of fix the different parts. So this is hopefully going to be a new type of personalised medicine. That's extraordinary. Congratulations to you and the team, Steve. Thank you very much for being here. Professor Steve Wilton. Thank you.